يا طالب العلم قم لتنم فإن الزمان انقضى وانصرم فكن ما حييت ضنينا به فظنك بالوقت عين الكرم وكن حلس درسك وافرح به تكن قائدا في غد للأمم وبادر شبابك من قبل أن يقطع عزمك سيف الهرم بسم الله بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله اللهم اغفر لنا ولوالدينا وللسامعين ولجميع المسلمين اجمعين another blessed day الحمد لله رب العالمين one of my dear brothers Abu Salih Ilyas Jazallah khair wa nafa Allah bihi has taken his time out and agreed to dedicate you know this short period of time that he'll be with us on this channel to have a nice بإذن الله تعالى beneficial chat so we'll let him straight on and بإذن الله تعالى we'll begin السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. عليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته. حياكم الله. الله يحييكم جزاكم الله خير أبو صالح. And I apologize to you first and foremost and to all those listening for the major delay, um, a bit of technical issues on my side. So عذروني. Uh, forgive me and بارك الله فيكم. So if you can just before we get straight into it, I just want to kind of get to know you because this is the first time we've actually been able to come together and to speak. So if you can introduce yourself to the audience, Jazakumullah khair. Absolutely, inshallah. My name, as you see the screen, Abu Saleh, Elias Aydarus and Kennedy. I'm a student at Uman Qura University in Mecca al Mukarramah. Alhamdulillah, Canadian student, origin Somali. I've been in the Mamlaka, in Mecca, alhamdulillah, I was accepted in 2012, but I went in 2013. Eventually got there in 2013, and Alhamdulillah, I've been there uh, ever since up until COVID. I've uh, been back, but Inshallah, I have about a year left, uh, two more semesters, and hopefully, we'll complete those uh, that last year, uh, this coming September. Within um, Taana, Alhamdulillah, I live in in the city of Toronto, in Toronto, Canada. Um, I do the best I can in terms of Dawa. Uh, between here and uh, the states in America, so the communities that have invited me, and uh, Alhamdulillah, I, I, as as you yourself uh, benefit your community, we're trying to do our best also out here in. Uh, in Allah Azza wa Jalla, Habibi, Barakallahu Fikum. So, um, with regards to like your, I want to know with regards to like your up- upbringing in Canada. Obviously, you said you lived in Somalia some por- some a portion of your life. How was that with regards to you know getting into the stage of you wanting to make that decision of actually wanting to apply and study and actually, you know, go out there and seek knowledge. How was that? Was there some sort of correlation or was it nothing at all? If you can, you know, highlight and elaborate, Barakallahu Fikum. And um, so in terms of my, in my, my upbringing, um, usually the norm for a Somali household uh, is a, it's a practicing, usually the mother practicing the father. So there's usually a, an Islamic upbringing uh, however, my my upbringing wasn't uh, wasn't like that so much. There wasn't much um, deen in my household. Okay. Didn't really grow up with salah or anything like that, other than um, like tahfid as a young kid, a very young kid going to tahfid. Um, however, in terms of practicing, uh, it wasn't until I was um, my final year of high school, or even the end of it, the end of high school, and that summer after high school. I uh, began practicing, but up until then, I knew little to nothing about Islam. Uh, and what was the me. reason? What was the cause of you know you wanting to start to practice the Deen of Islam? Yeah, I need the life. Is there a story I, behind it? Or? Anyway, um, I need the life living at that time. Uh, as without getting into you know, much details, um, I'm sure you also hear about um, Canada and. and crime, especially with Somalis, my community especially. Um, that was also a you know, product, uh, the famous statement, um, I was a product of my environment. So uh, that's the type of life I grew up in. Um, I lived in mainly um, in different neighborhoods, you know, neighborhoods that would be known as dangerous neighborhoods. And so I grew up uh, very far from the deep. Um, and doing whatever other kids my age at that time were doing, whether crime or whether other things, um, indulged in that, and very, very far from um, the guidance 
of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there was a major event that happened in my life um, around when I was uh, 17. And uh, that situation, um, it was kind of like a life or death situation, let's just say. And um, where uh, something that me and some of my friends at that time got involved in or something that we did, alhamdulillah, Allah, and he saved us from being caught. But um, that scare of what could have happened um, if, uh, if it would have went any other way, yeah. that was something that uh, scared me to start thinking about turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And um, at that time, it was something that uh, really pushed me to the point where, as they say, I went cold turkey, completely cut off everyone that I knew, um, as if I didn't even know them anymore. And uh, alhamdulillah, at that time, in the neighborhood that I lived in, this is in Ottawa, Canada, not in um, Toronto, a musalla opened there uh, from the blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It opened in the very neighborhood that I was doing whatever I was doing in. And that musalla had a student of knowledge, uh, elder, yani sheikh, say father student of knowledge, but he's well over 60, almost 70 now, uh, Libyan sheikh uh, by the name of Abu Muhammad Ali Ajan, who um, without him knowing, I'm not sure if he even knows even up until this day, but he was the main cause of uh, my, the first, time I ever saw anything like uh, any form of seeking knowledge or any form of learning a book on about Islam. The only thing I ever knew that existed was the Quran. Beyond that, I had no idea what he was Bukhari, Muslim was or um, any alim. I've never heard of an alim's name or anything like that. And he, alhamdulillah, is a kharij of Jamat Jamat Islamiyah, uh, I believe in the 80s, 80s uh, and uh, from the students of Sheikh Abdul Muhsin and Sheikh Rabia um, in that golden era. In, uh, so he was actually, so he was teaching in that musalla, that was what he was doing, he was active in da'wah. Yeah, he was teaching there. Him and uh, a few other Libyans were teaching there. And so when I first went there, uh, first started praying, etc. that is what, um, subhanAllah, the same corner that I would stand at prior to practicing is the same corner where mm -hmm. that musalla Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Okay, wallah, it reminds me of subhanAllah that sometimes, you know, the saying that you have to go through certain things in order to actually meet your Lord in order to kind of, you know, return back to Allah Jalla Jalla. Okay, subhanAllah. So at that time, I was around 18. I just finished high school at that time. And um, from then on, alhamdulillah, even then, um, all I knew was pretty much him. And I would attend his dhurus, but I didn't know... Um, about ulama or seeking knowledge beyond that. I didn't know about an Islamic university or any, anything like that. It was not only uh, not uh, after a couple of years, not until a couple of years later that I heard that you go abroad and you can go study somewhere, etc. So at that time, I finished high school. I was actually very good in school. I was the valedictorian of my high school class. I think I was in 2007. So I was studious. Although I was in the, yani, <laughs> alhamdulillah, because of my parents. Alhamdulillah, at least that part, um, both of my parents are educated. Alhamdulillah. Uh, and so they were very strict on me when it came to school. So I, I took my studies seriously, at least. Um, and so uh, I did well in, in high school. And I had scholarships to every university that I applied to, secular university. And uh, because I knew the environment of the secular university, I didn't trust myself at that time to go there and, and remain practicing. And so okay. uh, okay. I didn't go, I didn't go to the, to the uh, secular universities. I just worked, worked and just helped my family at that time. And then uh, a couple of years later, there was a student of knowledge that uh, also was a graduate um, from Medina, who's also from Ottawa who um, came to visit to give da'wah. And at that time, I got to know him and he was the sabab after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I gave him my, I gave my papers to um, another So student. how old were you at that time roughly? Um, so I'll say practicing wise, I was around 18, between 18 and 19. 
but okay. when I applied, I was about 21, I would say 20, 21, so about a year or two later. Okay. So throughout that time when you first went to that masala, you were, you know, continuously going to those lessons. Is it, and the thing is, what I wanted to actually, before before you go on, I wanted to ask you two questions. The mm -hmm. first question is, if we can just forward a bit, you know, let's rewind a bit back, sorry. Yeah. The point when you was with those friends and what have you, and you had that different life, yeah. um, did you see it that they were holding you back and they were the cause? And the reason why I'm asking you, uh, Akhil Karim, is because obviously we have a lot of shabab. And the, a lot of the shabab, you know, did maybe something that we did, or maybe some of them are in certain situations because of the fact that they have their peers. So would you say that that was one of the reasons? And when you did, the second question is, when you did end up cutting off everyone, did you see that that was the only way for you to kind of take those two steps without taking five steps backwards, meaning for you to progress? Okay. And uh, now let's actually take it even further back. Um, earlier in my high school, I forgot to mention this part, the first actual um, introduction to like an Islamic environment or anything like that is when I was 15, my parents, uh, or my mother mainly, uh, me and a couple of my friends, those same ones that I would be chilling with, um, yeah. they sent to Malaysia. And, okay. because, you know, getting into trouble and things like that. Um, we were, uh, you know, got into certain situations and our parents knew that if we continue to stay it's either jail or death so they they sent us to malaysia it was four of us and um one of us uh, has passed away now in that lifestyle so there's three of us he, he was killed um by a bullet he got shot in the head and uh, so uh, and um, I mean, I mean. So when we were there, we were there for about a year, and um, that's the first time I actually learned how to read the Quran. And it was because I, when I was younger, I would go to like, learn Arabic and things, but it wasn't ever consistent enough where I would get anywhere, um, any, 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 any progress. You know, it'd be a little bit here and there, and that was it. The first time was because when we went to Malaysia, it was a it was an international Islamic school in Kuala Lumpur, in the capital city, and they had a tahfid. They had a, a one of the classes was was Quran, and so there were some Eritrean teachers there, and obviously now we're in a Muslim country, especially Malaysia is also known for Quran and things like that, and so yeah. me, at 18 years old, I couldn't read at all, and so that embarrassment, that feeling of um, of embarrassment and shame actually pushed me um, to want to learn and force myself to learn uh, to the point where um, I would sit fajr and and struggle to read and I wouldn't leave the masjid. It was, this is after fajr. After fajr, I would sit down and struggle to read a line in the mushaf and I wouldn't leave the masjid until isha. I wouldn't leave oh. fajr oh. entire day, duhur up until asr, up until Maghrib up until Isha. After Isha is when I would go and I would start eating and things. It's a bit extreme, but the shame, I would cry uh, out of embarrassment because I would see young kids, eight years old, seven years old, mashallah, amazing Quran, amazing recitation, and all the regrets that I had because of the life that I was living and everything, all of that became very overwhelming and it pushed me to that. To that. Yeah. Um, and so alhamdulillah, even though I wasn't really practicing still then, but I just wanted to know how to read the Quran. I said to myself, yeah. I have to call myself a Muslim and I can read the book of Allah. And, and so that at least I benefited there. But to, to this to mention, I mentioned this to your point, which was when we were there, because of the environment there, it, it helped us at least pray sometimes here and there, go to Jumu'ah. Um, that school too, mashallah, they had even a time a break around 10 a.m. where we would pray Salat al-Duha. They would give like a half an hour break for the students to go pray Salat al-Duha. So uh, a bit of an Islamic environment. So when we came back to Canada, we, I was praying at least. I was praying consistently. But that oh, didn't happen. Yeah. And how long, how long did you stay in Malaysia for? A year. So I was there for a year. Okay. Yeah. And so when I came back, that entire year of Malaysia went to waste in one week because I went right back to the same friends. Standing in the same corner, literally, 
the night that I arrived and I was at my house, I got a knock on the door from my closest friends that, that were still here or still, yeah. you know, in Canada. Yeah. And one of them telling me, um, you know, come, so-and-so got robbed, his, his drugs got robbed, and you got to go get this guy, and here you go, here's the, this and that. Literally the night I arrived from Malaysia. Night, I wasn't even home for 15 minutes, and they were already there. SubhanAllah. Uh, like pulling me back pulling right you back. back. Into, pulling you back yeah. into that life. And alhamdulillah, that day I didn't. I closed the door on their face and told them, get out of here. But uh, a week later, I was right back in it. Right back, uh, right back in it. And uh, so the point of the friends and those you keep around you, um, I don't believe there is a way unless a miracle, unless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills, and those situations are rare. Yani as sahib sahib, as you know. Uh, yeah, the, the companion is, is the one that pulls you. Um, uh, also, yani yeah, friends, a lot of youth, when you tell them, you know, you know, stay away from so-and-so and so-and-so, they say, oh, well, I'm my own person. You know, no one can yeah. tell me to do and et cetera. They have these excuses. And this is what's worse from shaitan, because you are only friends with this person because of something in common that you have. You, you, you are never going to accompany someone that, uh, or befriend someone who you don't have any similarities with or things in common, or he likes to do certain things and you just don't like it. So what is, what is your purpose of your, what's the purpose of your friend if, if you have nothing in common? But rather, we'll do as they do. That is, that is the principle. And so uh, for me, it wasn't until I cut them off that I was even able to breathe even able to ever ever do any type of good or okay, that's a strong that's a strong word you used there you weren't you know the only way that you just what you said you weren't able to breathe subhanallah yes yeah, I mean, if you can elaborate what you mean for the shabab because a lot of the shabab do take it you know lightly with regards to who they surround themselves with because at that in in that type of life um it's like you're suffocating because if you have any ounce of imam you do sometimes here and there feel some sort of regret and, and some sort of, you know, what if I die in this state or what if I die in this situation? That those thoughts come to you here and there. And um, once you are finally out of it for a, you know, a, long, a long period of time or at least consistently, uh, it's like you can breathe again. Whereas when you live in that lifestyle, you're suffocating the entire time. You're only waiting, in, you're waiting to die basically. You're waiting either to die or to Especially like now, what the youth are doing now is overdosing. Or, you know, killing always existed, but now it's killing themselves. Somehow. Yeah. Um, you know, by their own hand. And uh, that life is a, is a suffocating life. Just a constant, you know, you wake up, same routine. A routine of uh, nothing uh, productive. Um, and, uh, your life is, is just being wasted in, in that type of life. So... It wasn't until I, I cut them off completely. And like I said, cold turkey completely. The people that I was the closest with and did everything with, they would be standing at that same corner where the Musala now opened. And I would walk by them as if I never met them in my life. But how did you manage to be able to do that? How did you manage to be able to, you know, you walk past someone that you once upon a time called a friend and now you're just walking past them as if they don't exist. How, how did you manage? What it was, was... Uh, uh, it was funny because when I first came back from um, Malaysia is when the Musala first opened and I was wearing a thobe and I would go to pray and they would mock me. Come on, man, who are you fooling? We know you, you who does this and that, you're, you're trying to tell us you're practicing. Like they would try to act like it's fake. I'm doing it for, for something else, you know? Yeah. And yeah. Then, yeah, who am I fooling? Who am I kidding? I took it off and I was right back with them. But the second time mm -hmm. after, that I mentioned that happened, which was uh, a situation I was in where someone almost died. Um, and if if that would have happened, alhamdulillah, that person didn't die. But if if they would have, uh, I don't know if my life would have been the same today. So uh, that situation is what pushed me because of how close I got to basically ruining my life forever. Um, <laughs> It, uh, it, um, it, 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 I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't go back 
the, the fear of what could happen. Um, and even like a silsila, it's like, it doesn't stop there, as you know, anyone who ever knows the streets, you do something, it comes back to you. It doesn't, uh, yeah. it doesn't, you know. So, yeah, just being in that life and always having to look over your shoulder and always having to this and that, um, that, uh, that, you know, obviously it's, it's attractive to go back to that lifestyle and it, it's appealing, but I would always have to remember that situation and, and the horror, the terror that I felt in that moment. And I couldn't trade what I was feeling now of peace, tranquility. I couldn't trade that for anything, for anything. No friend or no, no nothing could, could do that. I mean, it's a message to all those that think that, you know, it's difficult. It's not difficult at the end of the day. I think it's just like, like you mentioned, it's just about, you know, having that self-confidence and that character to be able to, you know, to want good and knowing that there's consequences to each and every single one of our actions. I want to just now ask you the question. After that stage, obviously you mentioned that there's someone else came, one of the graduates came and that was, you know, after Father of Allah, he was the cause of your planet. Before you answer that and go back onto that, what happened then with regards to you, your livelihood, you know, those companions now that you've left, how did you manage to make new ones? Was that difficult? Was it easy? Uh, the thing is, subhanAllah, for some reason at that time period, I don't know if it was, um, I don't know what it was about that year. This was 07, 07, 08. Uh, not just myself, but a few others that I grew up with and were, were, you know, we were around each other in that other life they also started practicing, subhanAllah, and, uh, and do the other events similar to mine. And Allah also guided them around the same time. So I saw some familiar faces, <laughs> subhanAllah, when I, when I started practicing. And, and some guys who were known in the city for that life, subhanAllah, yeah. I, even for myself, for my age group, when I started practicing, that had, had an effect on others. And likewise, others that I can think of now that I knew growing up, some even older than myself, they were like a motivation for myself, for me. Okay. I, okay. You know, they were living and what they were involved in and things that they've done. And now, you know, you see this peaceful person praying salah and shaking hands with people, talking softly. Who is this? Change their life around, basically. Change their life around completely. And so that was something that um, kept me firm to see how beautiful that was. And so, um, and also seeing the effect on others and, and how many people um, you affect when, when you, because uh, all of us have that same, um, same mentality that we can't change or, you know, I'm, I'm doomed basically, that I'm doomed um, mentality. And when you yeah. see someone that you may believe may have been even deeper in, in the game or deeper in the streets than yourself, um, changing and changing their life completely, it's a big, big push whether they even know it or not, it's a big help and a big motivation. Uh, even for the youth now, they see a lot of people, a lot of um, rappers or, you know, certain, even like non-Muslims. Imagine a Muslim who just starts practicing, but there's non-Muslims yeah. seeking Islam and becoming Muslim and, you know, knowing that this is the actual, the true life and what they're living and what they're, and they're not really happy in that life. And almost all of them say the same thing when they become Muslim. I feel at peace and I feel like I have a purpose now in my life. And a lot of the youth, the reason why I believe they're in the state that they're in, obviously there's all these vices and evils around them, but it's because yeah. they why they're alive. They don't know what the purpose of life is altogether. As yeah. Right? yeah. That's the problem. That's, a, that's, the, that's the root of the problem, amongst other things, but that is one of the biggest ones. So now we've got to the stage where you said you met this person, you've applied. Was your process easy in terms of applying? And what was the actual reason? Actually, I don't think you mentioned the reason why he was the means after the Fadl of Allah for you to apply. Yeah, so when I learned about, um, so the, the sheikh that I mentioned with, that was teaching us in yeah. Ottawa, I just knew him as a sheikh, a person upon the sunnah. Based on the people that were there, what they were telling me about him, I didn't know his studies though. Like he, he went to Medina and studied until later on. Um, yeah. and, uh, once I heard about that and heard some lectures also, that I'm, I'm fluent in, in Somali. So I would listen to some of the Salafi Mashaq in Somalia, their lectures. 
and I would listen to some biographies. I remember I listened to one of the Mashah, the biography of Sheikh bin Baz, Allah, and that was uh, emotional, subhanAllah, um, a very um, um, amazing, especially his young ages when he went blind. And yeah. uh, he was old when he went blind, and they told him that there was a surgery that he could do. And he said, I'll, I'll be patient with the, uh, with the test of Allah, subhanAllah, and, and what he became afterwards in terms of an mm -hmm. imam, that was something unbelievable. And also learning the virtue of the people of knowledge. And these things, when I started hearing these things, that's what really pushed me to want to seek knowledge. And then when that student came um, is when I first wanted to apply. So um, at that point, what I did was, and, and Mokura at that time was still accepting, um, you know, paper applications. Now everything is online. But back then, um, they were accepting, you know, paper applications. This was around 2010, 2011, 2000, yeah, around 2010. So what I did was I prepared all of my documents, every all the requirements, and put them into two different folders. And I handed it to another student who was studying at that time. That's from my from the city in, from Toronto, who also okay. know um, that other student I mentioned that came to give that one. They, they also know. So I asked them to take it to him because he had some sort of um, pull at Medina University at that time. And uh, so what happened was when that brother took my papers, both documents or both folders, he gave my Umar Qura application to the brother for Medina. And he gave oh, so that's, what, so that's why you made two actual files. Yeah, I made two files. Yeah, I wanted to apply to both universities. Okay, he, okay. Uh, did you have a preference at the time? I had Medina. I, I didn't even know that much about. Um, I didn't even know that much about Umar Qura. and my goal was Medina the whole, the whole time. And mm -hmm. uh, in my final year of high school, it was an Islamic school that I attended. So even though I wasn't really practicing then, um, is when I was starting kind of to pray and things like that. That um, graduating class, uh, we went to Umrah. So the graduating class mm -hmm. goes to. So that was okay. 18 years old. That was the first time I went to Mecca and Medina. And I saw the Islamic University then, and that's actually, I forgot that actually. That was um, the first time I ever heard of Medina University and everything. Um, and that is actually when I saw that. And then the student afterwards came to, to, to Canada to teach us. That's when I tried to apply. And so the other brother that I gave the papers to, he mixed the two folders and gave the Medina have uh, folder <laughs> but for Mokura and, uh, and my head <laughs> so so how I didn't get accepted to to Medina um or I, I never even checked to be honest I'm not even sure if I ever did get accepted but um Omokura with my Medina paperwork subhanallah uh <laughs> my paper given to Sheikh Wasila Abbas subhanallah wow it, Allah Akbar Allah it was given to Sheikh Wasila who applied on my behalf and and what was he at the at, at the time? Do you know what he was? Was he like the, like no. was he the Amir with the Dean? What was? Or you the don't know. He's a professor at the Jamia, but probably the longest standing professor. You know, the, the professor who's been teaching the longest at Umar Qura. If you're over and four, the Sheikh still teaching now. Hmm? I said, is the Sheikh still teaching now? He, he he because of his health, he's been. Uh, He's been on and off. I don't think he's, he's he taught these past couple of semesters. Alhamdulillah, I was blessed to to, to have studied with him in the jam. He taught me in the kulliyah. I'm going to get on to that after. So so what happened then? As soon as you know when the, when he was given the actual paperwork. Yeah. What, so, what, what... but this is all two years later. It took me two years and a bit to get accepted, actually. So when I applied in around twenty uh, around twenty ten is when I applied. And um, I, after one year, because at that time I would hear you wait a year to get to get a response. So I waited yeah. a year, and um, I I didn't hear anything back. So I kind of moved on with my life. To be honest, I gave up on it. I started working. Um, I went to the western part of Canada to work. There's better jobs there, things like that. There's oil there, so the wages are a lot higher. So myself and a lot. Brothers, we went there, we got apartments, living together and everything. 
and I was just there working. I completely forgot about Medina University or Oropora or anything like that. Um, I was thinking maybe at some point I'll go to Egypt, you know, but Medina and, and Oropora, that was not on my mind anymore. Until one day, uh, yeah, until one day I got an email from um, a brother who is a professor at Oropora teaching English. He teaches English there, but he was one of my teachers in, in Ottawa when I was in high school. So he knew me when I wasn't. Uh, he knew me when I wasn't practicing, and so he he really uh, tried a lot with me when I was uh, when I wasn't uh, yeah, he, uh, living proper. Basically, he really tried hard to get me, you know, in uh, in line or you know, living living properly and things like that. And so he emailed me saying um, the administration or something like that asked him if he, if they knew me because this is a Canadian student and we don't have a way to contact him, et cetera. So subhanAllah, he emailed me the, the acceptance letter and I was just frozen and not expecting wow. that to speak. There's brothers that I was living with and we're all in the same room. It was like, I got electrocuted. And I was wrong with this guy. Why, why isn't he uh, <laughs> speaking? <laughs> and, uh, subhanAllah, I told them. Did you me, believe it? Like, you know, when you, saw, when you saw that email, did you believe it or was it like? I could not believe it. Because it was something that I completely, you know, I, I completely gave up on. I wasn't even thinking about it anymore. And subhanAllah. So at that time, uh, as I said, I started just trying to save as much as I could uh, up until I would have to go. And I found out around tw 2012, maybe October, October, September, October 2012 is when I found out when he sent me the email. And then I, uh, uh, left in the western part of Canada, eventually came back to Toronto, uh, prepared, did all the paperwork and all the medicals and all the stuff they required you to do. Yeah. And, uh, February is when I uh, when I went there to Mecca for the first time, February 2013. And how about your family members? Were they happy for you? Or was my, mother, normal? my mother, uh, she knew how much I wanted to go there because I gave up on university right here. Yeah. And Dad was really adamant. He really wanted me to study uh, here because he knew how, how much I you know how hard I worked in high school. So he was kind of disappointed that I wasn't pursuing my secular studies. And so I kept telling him, but I'm waiting for, for Medina. I'm waiting for Medina. And he said, I'm not doing anything. Just, <laughs> why can't you just go study here? You know? Yeah, in the meantime, why, 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 why waste your time kind of thing? Yeah, why are you wasting your time? And you know, back and forth. And that topic would always come, come up between us until I eventually got accepted and him too. He was kind of like, okay, finally, you finally got it. Yeah, yeah at least you're going somewhere. Yeah, no, subhanAllah, it is difficult because of course, as a parent, you know, from yeah. their perspective, they just want you to kind of, you know, have a good education and a good future. Of course, yeah. So at that moment now, you've now got accepted. Do you know anyone in Mecca? Have you ever kind of, you know, do you know the life? Do you have any siblings or, or relatives or anyone living out in Saudi? Nothing other than that, that that teacher who 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 sent me the email. He was the only one I knew when I first got there, and um, so he helped me out get settled. I got my dorm room eventually. He took me shopping to buy things for my room and things like that. So he was the only one um, that I knew at the time. Um, in Medina, though, I knew a few people. There's a few students from Toronto that I knew, um, but at that time, I didn't even know how to speak Arabic. I didn't, so it was hard. It was hard in the beginning. Uh, and you know, before you tell me about, you know that your journey from um, Canada to Saudi, was yeah. it by yourself? Were you the only student coming from um, Canada or were there other students? Because I want to know exactly in terms of the setup, is it the same as how we have it in Medina as well? Or was it different? Well, I guess you guys have like a, like a mandub that, that, you know, gathers the students from a particular country, like someone responsible, right? We don't have any of that. You're on Up your until own. now? Yeah, up until now, you're on your own. I've actually, because I knew Medina is like that, I tried to suggest that many times. Um, to Umar, I don't know. I don't know, never, everyone's on their own. In, in, uh, wow, that must have been so that must have been a daunting experience then. Yeah, and I, there's so many students that have now come after me from countries from all over the world that I get there. Like they were accepted, but I contacted them. <laughs> from Holland, from different places. And um, and that's because they would see me 
they're on social media and stuff like that. They would see yeah. like to my Twitter and they know I'm somebody and they'll contact me privately. And I'll just do my best to get their names and go see, go um, to the admin office, look for their name and then send them their papers, the visa paper, and they would come. But for myself, when I first got accepted, uh, I was by myself. And I actually went by the UK first. Uh, I went by the UK to visit some of the brothers that I knew there at the time. And my, I have an aunt that, that lived in the UK. So I was in London for like, I would say a week, a week, a week and a half, about a week to 10 days. I was in, I was in London in, um, in South Hero, South Hero. And, I'm uh, sure I'm there, yeah. Yeah. So I, I was there until I eventually got to, um, to the Memlika. And like I said, when I got there, I did not know a soul other than that teacher. But how, if you, Akhil Karim, if you can explain to all the viewers listening, because obviously Medina is a bit more easy. You know, yeah. you come from London or from Canada or from whatever, you land either in Riyadh or Jeddah, majority land in, Jed in Jeddah, and then from there, Medina. Now, how did you, like, how did you guys commute from, or yourself, sorry, from Canada and then London to Mecca? How did you actually land in Umm Qura? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I can't even remember who picked me up from the airport now. Uh, when, I, when I arrived... It must have been him, that same teacher that I uh, that I knew, um, or I might have just taken a taxi. To be honest, I can't. But was it? Did you land in Jeddah first, or was it Riyadh or Medina? Where? In Jeddah, and the Mecca okay. has an airport, so um, you need either someone pick you up or um, you take a, a cab. So I think what, what possibly happened was when I um, there was a student studying there at the time that I knew also I was close with. And uh, I think what happened was he picked me up maybe once I arrived in Mecca with a taxi. I'm not sure, to be honest now, how I even got there to, to Mokura. But, um, oh, no, 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 it's the professor. Yeah, he was the one who brought me because what I remember is that same night, he put me in a hotel. Yes, he, I think it was him. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure. In a hotel for a few days and I paid for it and then I rewarded him. Uh, up until I got my dorm room mm -hmm. and set up. So, uh, How was that experience, you know, because obviously everyone goes to that holy city, uh, yeah. you know, for Umrah, usually, or for Hajj. Now you're going there to, you know, basically stay there for the next how yeah. many years of your life. Like, was that an experience that was an emotional experience? Was it daunting? Were you homesick? Can you, like, elaborate? Can you, like, tell us how, how was that for you? Yeah, I would say the beginning was the exciting more than anything. Um, excited and, and things like that, also kind of uh, overwhelmed because uh, there's so I had so much to do, but I, I don't know how, even how to communicate with anyone or where to go, or who to go to, go to go to for help or anything like that. I, I had no idea, but I was just excited to be in Mecca, praying in the Haram in the beginning, the first couple of weeks. Um, but then after that, Alhamdulillah, what made it not too difficult was. I started in the second semester. So I came in February. So oh, okay. it was only a few months. May, I went right back to Canada. So usually if you come September and you're there up until May, the homesickness hits you, you know, you, um, yeah. immediately. So for me, alhamdulillah, I was there from February to, to May and it was more excitement than anything. Um, but you, uh, I started feeling the homesickness the, the, the first full year. So after that summer, when I came back, yeah. Um, that's when I would feel, um, you know, the homesickness and uh, because you're a student, but I guess we're going to get to that too, but you don't have an income, you don't have certain things, it's, it's difficult. You just live off what the jam gives you. And so it's, you have to budget and you have to, life was obviously not, not, not very easy, um, especially for Umar Qura. There's a big difference between Umar Qura and Medina. Medina has buses that take you here and there. It has, um, you know, Mokura is a school intended for Saudis, not for yeah. foreign Muslim. Yeah. yeah. So you're kind of on your own. You have to have your own car. You have to, to, to be able to get around and stuff like that. So um, mostly we had just taxis and, and that's about it. Even having a bus this was uh, like a small bus. If you miss that bus, that's it. You, uh, you, take, um, you take a taxi or if, it's, if it fills up, you take a taxi to school. That's it. It's into the genre. 
Subhanallah, yeah, you know, it's, it's it, as you mentioned, it's a complete different setup because I'm actually shocked. I thought you guys have, you know, Eliyaz and Mandub, as they call it, for people that are helping people out and what have you. But, um, you know, you telling me that is something new. I didn't know that. So, okay, now you've landed. Did you straight away go into the Ma'had Arabic Institute and just, you know, just attend but not take the exams because obviously you came midway through? Or what did you do exactly? And is it the same setup where you, you're supposed to be there for two years and then four years in the faculty? No. So when I first got there, they tested me right away, maybe the first couple of days. And I, uh, like, I can understand because Somali language, so, so much of it is, uh, is Arabic. Yeah. I can understand when someone is telling me something, I could understand when someone was telling me something, but grammatically or to be able to respond with a proper sentence in Arabic, I couldn't do. So they, I, I, went, I chose Mustawalawal right away. I said, put me in Mustawalawal. So I started that same semester, actually, when I arrived. Um, they, they, they started me right away. So that February when I arrived, I started, I was a couple of weeks late, I think, but I, yeah. I started right away. I didn't... Uh, yeah, study as like an audit student and then start the next year i didn't do that okay and what do you guys what what did you guys cover within the arabic institute is it is it um the is it what, what, what books do you go through what's your curriculum so there's a muqarra there's the the mahal itself has a curriculum um and the curriculum in terms of the arabic is um kitab al-asasi it's kitab al-asasi um okay. but Many of the teachers that we had, especially the Sudani ones, they would just use Bani Adik. They, they, we, um, most of what we studied was whether it's Muhadatha, you know, a dialogue class, whether it's Qira'a, whatever it was, um, they would use Bani Adik. Uh, okay, mashallah. And you know, with regards to you guys, was it two years as well? Is that what is still upon two years? Yeah, it was two years. Um, yeah, so four semesters, four levels, and then there the difference. Uh, there is a difference also. Medina, I'm not sure exactly how it is, but for Um Al Qura, if you fail even one lesson, like one course in yeah. all of the four mustawiyat or those four levels, you do not go to kulia. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And um, you have to also graduate with MTS. Even Jayyid Jiddin, you cannot get into kulia. That's very good, yeah, because um, that's so oh. MTS meaning, you know, that's like an A star, isn't it? A star, exactly. So I believe it's yeah. like 80 average or higher or something, or yeah, 80% average or higher. Um, wow, that's serious. Obviously, so from, from me understanding that, they want you to have a very good level of Arabic. Exactly. So it's 3.5 GPA and up is, is how you can get into the Kulia. Otherwise, you don't get into Kulia. Okay, and and you know when you when you landed, did they give you some sort of allowance or any sort of means of you being able to you know support yourself financially? Did the university do that? I know, alhamdulillah, when I first arrived, I because I was working a little bit, so I came with my savings, so I was just using that slowly. And then the the mukafa, I guess the, the allowance that they give us monthly, that came a little bit later, maybe, maybe the next month, maybe maybe a month or two later, it started. Okay, so is that the same as Medina 840, the beautiful 840 real? What exactly? <laughs> so, okay, so I, I thought it was a bit different, but how about in terms of now the restaurant and what have you? Because obviously I know Umm Qura. How far is it, by the way, to tell the viewers that don't know, how far is it from the actual haram? Uh, so Umm Qura has two campuses. There's two campuses for Umm Qura. So the Ma'had is in, is in one campus which is situated in Al-Aziziyah, Hay Al-Aziziyah in Mecca, which is about, I'd say, 10 minutes from the Haram by taxi. Okay. Uh, which side of Aziziyah you take it from? About 10 minutes um, from, Az from, from, from uh, the Haram. But the actual Kulliyah, so where the dorms now are, and, yeah. uh, and where we study, you know, the actual, in the actual faculties, it's about 25 minutes, I would say. About 25 minutes by bus. The and where, where 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 are the student buildings? If you're in, if you're studying in the Arabic faculty, like, sorry, in the Arabic Institute, are you still living where the faculties are, or are you living somewhere else? Or yeah, so when we first got there, um, we actually didn't have dorms on the campus where the kulliyat are, where the faculties are, the main university. Yeah, uh, the Jamia rented buildings, and so we used to live in those buildings. 
in a neighborhood. How far were they from the actual Arabic Institute? Like, was how were you guys commuting from A to B? Now, the the actual kulia, so the kuliyat where the kuliyat are, is is actually outside the hudud of the Haram. It's very far. It's uh, it's you know, the Taif. It's like on your way to Taif. So it's uh, okay. it's out of the city a bit. It's desert. You see camels and, and goats and things like that on campus as you're studying. <laughs> wow, yeah. So now the dorms are there, but when we when we first um, began studying, so the the second campus where the Ma'had is is in Azizia, and our old dorm, the buildings that they rented is probably in between, halfway in between, the where the Kuliyat are, the main campus, and the Ma'had. It was right center in the in the middle, in between the two. So from the Mahad, it's probably 10 to 15 minutes away by bus, uh, the old the old dorms when I first got there. Yeah. And how about, like, how about from when you got there to now, when you got there, did you guys have those shuttle buses or those buses that were taking you from A to B? And did you have to pay for them? And have things changed since? So the, the buses we had were like mini buses, like the ones in Medina that take you from Bab uh, Khalfi. <laughs> well, <hopefully. laughs> yeah. <I don't> <laughs> the stampede buses, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So we had those, and uh, they would take us. Um, and and uh, and then there was other ones that were a bit bigger. Um, not as big as the ones that take you guys to the Haram, but a bit smaller than that. Um, and then okay. now, coach buses. So actually, very nice coach buses. Some new, like I guess, like South Coast, South Coast style buses. Oh, that's nice. National Express buses. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's nice, Masha. That's nice. Yeah. Um. So you know your time in in the Arabic faculty, mm-hmm. was it difficult for you? Was it hard? Did you manage to make new friends there? Was it easy? And also, in terms of like that setup or that classroom, how many? students were there because obviously there weren't many um, foreigners generally speaking in Qura. and then when you got to the faculty the ratio between the Saudis and the non-Saudis what was that like? Yeah so in the Ma'had uh, which is one of the blessings in comparison to Medina our classrooms were very small meaning the amount of students in the classroom so my yeah. first well, I went, we were eight students that's it MashaAllah yeah. benefit a lot that's more. a private lesson Exactly, literally, exactly. <laughs> you benefit a lot more, and the, and the teacher can interact with you a lot more. So in a two-hour lesson, um, you know, he that, that that professor will know, you know, the strengths of a student and the weaknesses of a student. Know all the students on a first-name basis, and you know, remember you all the time. And so it was easy. It was a lot better to study in that type of environment. Um, the most that it would, that it ever got to is probably 15. I would say I don't think my, any of my classes ever passed 15. Other than sometimes they would, um, because what we had is let's say from Mustawa Owen, we had four different Mustawa Owen classes, and Mustawa Thani same thing, like four different classes. So sometimes for some classes, they would bring us all together, and we would study. Uh, like okay, okay. You know, so for. Yeah. The, Classes, fiqh and aqid and stuff like that, they would bring us all together. And even that would probably still be half of a class of a kulia. The classes they yeah, have in kulia. Oh, that's beautiful, that's beautiful. Yeah, as well, like, very nice. So the, the ma'had, to be honest, I would say is very strong and very good. The muqara ma'had is a very, very, uh, you benefit a lot. Yeah, I know. I've seen you guys' curriculum. It's really nice. Yeah, mashallah. Really, really yeah. nice. And other than a lot of people have a misconception and they think when you study two years Arabic, you're only learning Arabic. You, know, you learn, you have Quran class, you have Aqidah, you have Fiqh, you have Hadith, Sciences, you have... Yeah, we did Bequniya in Mr. Rabi. we did Bequniya in Mr. Rabi. We did Bequniya in Mr. Rabi. We had Tafsir Ibn Kathir, we had, we had a Tafsir class. But we had actually some books, well, that's some benefit. Um, even there, like a, a nice intro before you get into the kulia. Before you get into faculty, yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, and in terms of friends, that was my other questions. Friends-wise, did you manage to meet a lot of foreigners from the West, or how was that like? Uh, when I first went there, um, 
I try to avoid English speakers as much as possible so that I can learn Arabic. That's okay. what I did. So that I did don't you see that as something good? Was that a good decision that you did? It was the best thing to do because uh, if you, and what I noticed a lot of the people that were there, and I, I, I know multiple languages, I speak French fluently, I speak Somali, and I speak um, English. So there's a lot of different. We didn't know that about you, Muhammad. French. I think we need to uh, some bonjour. I don't know French at all, but <laughs> so I speak French yeah, I like and now Arabic. But at that time, the Somalis, I would avoid them. The, any okay. English, American, Canadian, British, I would avoid. Um, any French speakers, French brothers, Belgian brothers, any, I would avoid them because they're gonna throw me off. I'm just gonna speak in that language, and yeah. I won't, you know. But well, there's like, wait, wait, wait. I, I think I need to pause there. I need to pause. Where's oh, the French coming? Yeah, I'm from Djibouti actually. I'm from Djibouti. Okay, Allah barik, mashallah. Ali origin, but Djibouti. I was born in Djibouti, and my parents also from Djibouti. So it's a French colony, and uh, both my parents speak French and they studied in French. So from young, I was put into French. So I studied in French actually, my studies when I was younger. Up until high school. High school is when I switched to English. Allah Barak, mashallah. Very good. Very, very good uh, to have that uh, language. Is very important. Sorry, carry on, please, Mark. So, um, when I when I first got there, there was a brother who, um, a brother named Rahman, who uh, he's from Reading, and he was there when I when I first got there, and I I didn't know him prior to that, but he also had that him. For learning Arabic and, and and really becoming fluent in it, and so because he would not speak to me in English, I would so me and him became best friends from the get go. I actually met the brother Subhanallah, may Allah preserve him. For those that don't know, is it Ijada Arabic, right? Or Ijada? No. Is no. it what, what's 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 the name of his? Uh... Ijada Institute. Yeah, that's it. For those that don't know, if they want to check it out, they can check it out. Yeah, yeah mashallah. So. He, uh, at the beginning, would um, uh, try to learn Aramiya, especially, always try to learn. He would always ask if he heard, here's a new word, what does that mean, this and that. And so he was very eager to learn Arabic and only speak in Arabic, and that's it. So me and him, we became very close, only chose to speak in Arabic, even if in the beginning we were at, like, beginning level. Yeah. Um, forced ourselves to only speak in Arabic as much as possible. And so that helped a lot. And, and also avoiding everyone else <laughs> so that I don't use uh, the languages that I, that I know. So, oh, that. And then obviously, when you got to the Kuliya now, before you tell us which one you chose, how many different Kuliyas do you have? And how's the setup? Is it just you just choose what you want to go to? Would you get examined beforehand? Uh, so uh, for us, before we even get to that, to show you the benefit of that tactic of avoiding speaking in your either mother tongue or whatever the case is, always using your you know another language and how that affects how what you become for Umm al qura i'm not sure how it is from from medina but Umm al qura every exam is a written exam and an oral exam for every course that we take other than quran is is always a hifth you he asks you where to, you know to recite from yeah. memory but every other course that we take there's a written test and there's an oral test um so they want to see that you comprehend the, 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 what, they're, what they're teaching you. So, um, and they also do a, a thing where the professor that taught you is the one that is testing you on the oral exam. So they switch okay. professors. Yeah. Okay. So he doesn't you from anything, that professor that's testing you. So um, I had an Egyptian teacher who taught me in the fourth level, Qira'a, which is like reading comprehension. You read a text and answer questions and things like that. And you have a discussion in class. So that course, there was an Egyptian teacher who, who taught me. And during the oral exam, it was a Sudanese teacher who was testing me. So he would tell me, okay. they would test us on a book that we didn't actually study. So he would bring, he would open, so for the class, for the actual course, we studied Kitab al -Asasi. But in the yeah. test, he gave me Bain al the last level. He just opened any page and told me to read. So he wants to see how okay. it Yeah, yeah. And then he asked me certain questions to see if, I, if I'm if i understanding what I'm reading. And so I answered. And then uh, 
and then he said to me, he said, uh, he said, you, Akid, you, 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 you know, you learned Arabic before you came here, or you speak Arabic at home or something like that. And I said, no, I said, no. He said, so before you came here, how, how many years did you spend in Egypt studying and stuff? I said, I learned Arabic here. I said to him, I did not learn Arabic. I learned Arabic day one, the day that I arrived here, other than like Alif and learning how to read. Before I yeah. did that, full understanding and read, I never studied Arabic before that. He said, yeah. He said, take the one to fill haram. That you're lying. <laughs> Lying and you're in the haram. <laughs> yeah, I think I think what a lot of them do get, you know, they are astonished to see that someone came here with nothing, zero, meaning no language, no nothing, and they're able to speak with you know a high level of fluency. And because he said to me, he said, other students that we've tested right now, they can barely speak. He said, so why? How is it that you did that? Like, what, what's the secret? And that's what I told him. I said they, like the African students, and some of them. They just stick together. So the Nigerians yeah. one with one another, Ivory Coast, they all stick. They all stick together and speak their language all day. And so yeah, that's yeah. good. And I, I avoided using my languages, I told them. And uh, and they said, okay, now it makes sense. So that's, that's, that's I mean, that's, 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 that, that's a message to all those that are, you know, about to, you know, go out to study anywhere in the world in terms of whether it's Egypt or Saudi, the Irish language. As you can tell, the brother of Hassan says it, and it, obviously you can see that it, it benefited him to never stick around with those people that speak your mother tongue or the language that you speak. Because, and I've seen it as well. We all see at the end of the day, it, it makes you limited with regards to your level of fluency and you being able to use that language day in, day out. Yeah, you have to be able to think in Arabic when you're thinking. Yeah. That's what it is. When you start Indeed. thinking stuff in your, in your mind, you're hearing Arabic, that's when you know that you've reached the level of fluency you're, you're thinking in, in Arabic now. And another thing that benefits, alhamdulillah, those who have like a Salafi background before they come is that they know the ulama. So they go to the durus of the mashayikh and they're hearing lughat al-ilm, they're hearing knowledge, they're hearing the language of knowledge, um, they're listening to tapes, whereas the students who yeah, they don't know that, that they haven't been exposed to that. Um, they just go to jamia and stay in their dorm. And so they don't get that. And also, if you're any blessed enough to be able to get close to some of the mashaya, whereby you know you they call you on the phone and when they want to you know sit with you and you, you you as if you're you became one of their companions, you're speaking in Arabic all the time more than English, and that's yeah. also. Awesome. Um, with regards to the faculty, if you can just quickly, because there are some things I want. I don't know. Are you good into? Are you good with time, Achi? Yeah, I'm fine, I'm fine. Okay. Um, faculties, mm -hmm. different types of faculties, and if you can just touch upon maybe bits and, you know, the gist of what they study, and then get onto your faculty in terms of that which you're actually in now. So, Umar Pura, as we said in the beginning, uh, it's, it's, it's mainly secular studies. So it has yeah. pharmacy, it has um, education, it has, you know, many different faculties for, for secular studies, media studies, all of this stuff. Um, yeah. And then uh, some kulliyat for shari'i, shari so legislative knowledge. So from those is Qur'an, is okay. of Qur'an. And for them, it's, it's those who want to specialize in the sciences of Qur'an and in ulum of Qur'an in general. Like yeah. someone who's going to be a of, of the qira'at and things like that. So that's someone's aspiration. And then I believe uh, from the conditions you have to be hafid and they study in yeah, many different books, Asha, Tabi, uh, but they go deep into it. The, 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 the difference of opinions in the Qira'at and they go deep, deep, deep into, into these, into yeah. that, of the Quran. There's Sharia and the difference, and I'm not sure, um, Qura, uh, sorry, uh, Medina, if in the, in the Kulliya level that they have Aqsam. I believe this could be the hadith. This could, uh, you guys have da'wah. You yeah. have you have sharia. Do they have aqsam uh, or no? In the, uh, in the, uh, right now, I don't know how it is, but before then, no, it's just if you're hadith, hadith, you have sharia, sharia. I think sharia now made um, two different you know, two different levels within okay. the actual sharia. Okay. If I'm so, not mistaken, but obviously, 
generally speaking, it's not like how you guys have it in Riyadh. I think both of you guys have it differently. Yeah, so for us, it's Aqsam. So you have the Kulliya at the top. So Sharia, yeah. for example, has Kulliya to Sharia. Then they have Fiqh under it. So you specialize yeah. more so than anything else. And they have Qawa. And I believe Qawa is only for Saudis because, you know, eventually they yeah. can work in sports and yeah. things like that. And there's also Usul al-Fiqh. Usul al-Fiqh and there's Tariq. Uh, Tariq al-Islami. Those okay. four... Um, could it so da'wah? all those four fall under the actual faculty. Yeah. So for us, when we're choosing our kulia, we don't only choose our kulia, we also choose the qism we want to go into. So sharia, we choose fiqh. Sharia, tariq. Sharia, usul al-fiqh. Depending on what you want to specialize in. Yeah. So what, it will, what will happen is the courses you'll do, the load of usul al will be way higher than, than anything else. If, if you choose usul al-fiqh. And likewise, tariq. If you choose tariq, it'll be more about tariq. You will still study fiqh and usul al-fiqh and everything else, but you, more of the courses, more so, the concentration will be on tariq if you choose tariq, usul al-fiqh if you choose usul al-fiqh, and fiqh if you choose fiqh. And that's how okay. it is. Um, then we have lugha. So lugha, there's nahu and, and saraf, the different branches. So it goes into four also for lugha. When it's a lugha, a lugha the Arab. And it has its own streams. But Quran doesn't have a Quran, doesn't have aqsam as well. Quran, I'm not sure if it has aqsam. I don't okay. think so. Because Aslan, I don't know how many people go into it. You know, that that want uh, that want you know to specialize just in that science. Okay. In yeah, yeah. Their country, not as much people. I don't think so. Um, and there's kulit al da'wah wa al din, and under that is um, qiraat. So Qiraat is, uh, is um, it's not like Qulitul Qur'an where you specialize in it. You, you have um, tafsir, the load of tafsir and ulum al-Qur'an um, is higher. Um, and also Qiraat, but not to the level of the Qulitul Qur'an itself. Um, and there's no sharq okay, of okay. Qiraat. So that's if you want to study that. Then there is um, Aqidah. So, Qism uh, al-Aqidah, that also comes under Da'wah wa Rasul al-Din. And there's um, Al-Thaqafa al-Islamiyyah. Al-Thaqafa al-Islamiyyah is like a lot more social. Um, you study um, you study some tariq, you study some history, you study about the Dawla uh, and the Mamlaka, its history. You study about marriage life in terms of Islam. Um, you know, like social thing matters as it pertains to yeah. the different religions. So Islam, Islam yeah. and give you marriage and Judaism and Christianity, etc. how they, you know, and also the Islamic system, governing system of the, the, the for example, the Hudud and these types of things, the justice system okay. uh, in yeah. comparison to the Western world and, and their justice system and, and these types of studies you study in Al-Thaqaf al um, And then you have uh, Kitab al-Sunnah. And the Kitab of Sunnah is my is my qism. That is the qism, okay. and that concentrates on ulum al Quran, so tafsir and different ulum al Quran. Also qiraat, and then we have one class of qiraat um, and ulum al Hadith together. So because I always wanted to study Hadith, I wanted to go to Medina, and this is the closest thing that you can get. Okay. 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 And ulum ulum and ulum of, of Quran together, kind of. So you study that. So those are most of the the, the classes. But um, um, Quran, uh, one thing that I like about their curriculum, it's a lot more comprehensive than Medina, for example. Medina, you really, really specialize in your tahassus for Medina. Yeah. Um, for Umar Quran, it's shamil. You do specialize in your in your tahassus. However, you get, um, uh, for example, we have a class called Firaq. We have a class called Adyan. We are, and I'm in Hadith and, and Ulum al-Quran, but I'm studying also those things. So some of the courses that are in Aqidah that they would specialize in, we also have some of that. So some of what every Qism has, we also have some of that. Even Ulul al-Fiqh. I have, for example, in, in, in Qism um, uh, Kitab al-Sunnah, we have two classes of Usul al-Fiqh, like two different levels. 
one and two. We have fara'id, fara'id we have tw twice, we have it twice. Uh, tafsir, we have it maybe seven times. And uh, we have um, a hadith al-ahkam, that's more uh, sharia, but we have it twice also. So it's more shamit. You get you get a lot of everything. Fiqh, we have it maybe five times, fiqh classes. How was it? Alhamdulillah. So it's a lot more shamit, even though you do specialize in your, in your tafsir. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, actually, don't 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 uh, get it wrong. With regards to the hadith, for example, we also have it, but I don't know to what degree you guys do it. But like, for example, the first semester, back in my days when I did it, the, the what you call it, hadith, we had the first semester we had uh, tarbiyah Islamiyah, we had manahij al bahf in one semester, we have also tarikh as well, and then we study faraid as well one semester, fiqh as well five six semesters I believe tafsir. But obviously it depends on the setup and how you guys do it as well. But they do also cover certain aspects. But yeah, yeah. in terms of the way it's done and delivered, that goes back down to a teacher. But we do cover certain things. We do yeah. fiqh as well and at the end. But it's only one. One yeah, exactly. actual. It's only yeah. one. Because yeah. you guys in your tachasis. You just get exactly, the, yeah. that fen, but you, you really specialize in your tachasis. Yeah, because they go in deep. Like for example, hadith, you go in maharaj, you go deep. Sharia, exactly. you go deep with regards to the fiqh and usul al fiqh. Quran, exactly. you go deep with regards to tafsir and yeah. so on and so forth. No, but mashallah, that, that is a nice thing. Whenever I used to hear of the whole branch, I used to, I used to, I used to look at like a branch. Like you've got the, um, you know, like for example, Sharia, and then you've got, you know, fiqh and, and qabah and all these other stuff. And same, I think, I think Jamiat al Imam has got similar setup, I believe, or no? Mashallah, so now I want to move on to some other questions from them. Um, you know, from your own personal experiences, Kareem, how was or how did you manage to maintain staying there for all those years and you know, off just 840? Was it a thing where you'd go back in the summer? You know, was there times when you struggled? Was it difficult? How was that process? So, um, before I went there, um, there was uh, there were a few brothers that there's a, you know, a few brothers in Toronto who wanted to learn Arabic. So yeah. Like not me teaching, but to try to find them a teacher or something. So I at that time I reached out to the the same brother who sent me the email uh, that when I got accepted, I reached out to him to see if he knows any teachers in Mecca that would be willing to teach online if I set it up. So he actually knew. Uh, one of the professors at them in the Mahad, Sudanese teacher. Uh, okay. Who later on became my teacher, so when I, when I went to the Jannah. But he oh, originally took no. me to him who yeah. teach and I would pay him. And at that time I was working, alhamdulillah, I, I, I was good financially. So I would gather the money and send it all to him. And so it's okay. just to brothers and sisters to learn Arabic from an actual professor at Umar Qura University. So this was way back in 2012. So I okay. did that at institute just to facilitate classes for brothers and sisters. Then afterwards, when I uh, when I got there, I met him eventually. I met him in person eventually, um, and uh, I, I started doing it again. However, like to also earn some sort of you know uh, something for myself as well. So yeah. I put a lot more time into it, and I also got. Um, not only him, but a couple of other teachers from Omokura and also female teachers from Omokura. Likewise, all Sudanese, all of them. And they're like a circle, they all know each other. So he reached out to the others. And so I had classes for sisters and for brothers from Omokura teachers. And so students would pay uh, for the courses and then I would pay the teachers and I would have something for myself. So that helped me for a few years while I was there. That yeah. helped me. To, to just maintain. However, um, it eventually I, I stopped. I couldn't maintain it um, because um, obviously professors of that caliber, they require a certain amount. You know, it's not worth it for them if they're not getting paid, you know, a certain amount. Yeah, yeah. And also me with my studies as it got heavier um, in terms of Korea um, uh, now and also outside of the jam. I couldn't really keep up with it, do it. So I, I had to uh, and sh shut it down because those professors, they could teach, but they couldn't run it on their own. They didn't yeah. know how to do it. 
I eventually just um, stopped it. And then that that time was, was difficult because I didn't have any type of income. Um, and uh, there were there were times even where Mukafa, as you know, sometimes doesn't come on time. It's late. Yeah. Things, the allowance that the Jama'a gives us. And so there was a year where I believe it was 2015, I think, 2014, 2015, just before the summer, I was actually planning not to go back that summer and to really oh. stay and to just benefit from the dhurus, the dorat that would happen yeah. in the summer. And uh, and the mukafa, I didn't come. And subhanAllah, I went three days without eating food. Three days. Oh, yeah, because most of the students were gone. So there was no one to even ask. You know, it was summer basically. It was like summer break, yeah. almost gone. Um, I was just drinking water, subhanAllah, zamzam. I had like a bottle of zamzam in the fridge, but I keep drinking it. Um, when my last two reals, whatever reals I had left were finished, I had three days. I didn't eat a meal, an actual meal. No breakfast, lunch, or dinner. I just kept no. drinking water. So a brother eventually um, sent me something through my Canadian account to help. And I, and I eventually actually left. I just went back to Canada so to try to earn some money, to try to um, you know, not be in that situation. Because if they jammed me, I'd never sent the money, what would I have done if I stayed yeah, back? Exactly. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So that happens. That definitely happens. And so my advice, actually, because of my experiences, and and obviously you also know, that is mostly the experience of almost every student. Yeah. Almost every, yeah. less either their families are well off, or they they have they were blessed to think of opening some sort of business before they came there or something that's running itself. Other than that, almost every student goes through goes through this uh, financial. Um, difficulties and a lot of them leave the Jamia because of it and yeah. they don't come back. Yeah. So um, my advice would be for those who have the intention to go study is uh, is for them to work on not just saving money. Now I used to tell brothers years ago, save money. Just save as much money as, as you can so you can bring it with you. Yeah. But even because it's going to run out. You have to have yeah. a income while you're there. You have to do something with your money that you do save that's going to earn you money while you're there. Whether it's starting a business, an online business, whether it's something, whatever it is, uh, whether it's buying things from Saudi and bringing it back to whatever country you come, you're coming from and selling it there, you have to be able to have an income while you're there to sustain yourself. Just like the Salaf, we know from the Salaf, Bayt and Shara, and they were, they were businessmen, and that's how they you know, would travel from city to city. And, and, and um, gather a hadith and things like that. So, um, especially it, now, subhanAllah, because of the whole VAT increases and what have you, things are much more expensive than, for, you know, for example, when you went in 2012. Yeah, yeah, yeah. SubhanAllah, before, I always joke now when I, try to, when I try to explain to brothers who don't know about a lot of the changes in Saudi in terms of expenses, I say back when I first went there, when you, want, when you get to the gas station and you want to pay for your gas, you just kind of look under your seat for any change and you pay. You can fill your tank with that. <laughs> you know? No, it's not the same. <laughs> yeah, no, a lot of changes happen, subhanAllah. Yeah, big time. So now it's maybe like three times more the price that I won than when I first got there. So subhanAllah. So yeah, things are a lot more expensive. Rent is a lot more expensive. Food is a lot more expensive. Everything. Is a lot more yeah, it must have been great. So I actually want to also ask you as well, with regards to, um, you know, was there a stage when you got married and then brought your family there? Was that experience hard or difficult or generally speaking as well? Is it easy for brothers to do that if they want to do that, if they do get accepted in Umm Qura? Because things out in Medina, it's just, you know, that's a whole different ballgame. Yeah, it's difficult. It's very difficult because your shurut are... are, are, are yeah. yeah. Now it's gone up to 36k, Habibi. Oh, subhanAllah, subhanAllah. Yeah. SubhanAllah. So for us, Umm Qura, when I first came, you, you actually had to go through them to sponsor your family to come. Yeah. Now you don't even do it. They give you the freedom to go to the Jawazat yourself. You do everything on your own. Your My family God. can do it. SubhanAllah. You just get a paper from them that shows that you're a student at the Jamaa, some form. Yeah. And that's it. You take the documents, everything, your family's documents to the um, 
uh, I can't remember where it was, if it was Jawazat or ministry or something, someplace in Jeddah. Yeah. You go there, you apply it yourself, and you bring your family directly by yourself. They don't put a shirt on you of money, or you have to show the proof of a, of, of a place. I think they should, they ask you for proof of rent. Like if you show them out of somewhere you live. And yeah, that's it. Tennessee agreement. Yeah, that's it, a lease agreement, and that's about it. Um, they don't ask you for anything. In terms of money in the bank account, I'm not sure if I if if they were introducing that at some point, but I don't I don't think they've done that. No, but the, they've given you guys a green card, basically. Yeah. Back, inshallah. <laughs> so it, it is easy to bring your family, but to maintain life while there, um, like if, if if when you're just a single student and it's difficult yeah. to, live, yeah, and you imagine you have a wife and kids. So it is very difficult. Um, I did at one point um, bring my family uh, there at the time, um, and it was difficult. It was not easy at all. And and for me, it was in Jeddah, um, and uh, I would commute from Jeddah back and forth between Jeddah and in Mecca. And how was that? How did you manage to balance that? That was difficult. I was barely sleeping sometimes, half asleep while driving, and. Uh, it was, uh, I even had a scare one time, subhanAllah, almost, almost died on the highway. A tire, while I was driving to Mecca in the morning, the tire flew off, Wow. on the road and everything, subhanAllah. And, and, uh, and at the time, were you by yourself or? I dropped off my family at work where they were, they were teaching, and I yeah. go to the jamia, and that happened, subhanAllah. And that day, the funny story that happened, usually, you know, you yourself know in terms of how um, uh, punctuality of the Saudi students. Yeah. When they yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> they arrive as the class is ending, basically, sometimes. <laughs> so so um, every professor, every class has to bring their strict rules. And if you are late and, you know, they don't really have any other way to get them to, to attend. So they have to be strict. So. I had one professor who basically gave us his guidelines from the get-go, first day. And he said, uh, you know, if you arrive after me, that's a ghaib, not even late. <laughs> You're absent in my book. You can yeah, benefit. Many of those. Yeah, you sit there, you can benefit, take your notes, everything. But yeah. I already, yeah, you're absent, yeah. And then for us, Al-Munqura, yeah, if you have uh, four absence, that's it. You failed that class. Just wow. four. Throughout and the whole semester? Yeah, the whole semester you fail. You fail the whole semester. And subhanAllah, and not only for other, even with other, even if you were sick and legit sick, even if you were in the hospital, even if you got in a car accident, they don't they don't care what the reason is. Just four absences, you're out. Wow. You're out. You're out that for that semester, you failed that semester. You have to do that class again. You failed the that specific course, I mean. So it's very, you know, that's, um, that's very strict. Very strict, yeah, it's very strict. So, and me coming from, I have an 8 a.m. class and I'm coming from Jeddah, it's like an hour and a half drive. So I have to start very, very, literally after Fajr. And um, so that day when that happened and you know, the tire flew off and everything, um, I was obviously going to be late. There was no, there was no way I was going to make it. I was maybe like 45 minutes late. And then I'm standing at the door I knock, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the event, and you have to ask for permission to enter. And he said to me, "Look at the time. What time do you think you're coming?" You know, and uh, I, and I apologized and everything. And I said, uh, uh, "I understand. I'm I don't, I don't mind. But you know, something happened." He said, "Well, what happened?" Because it wasn't my norm to 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 be to be late or anything like that. I was always normally there before him, so and sitting in the front of the class and things like that. So yeah, I, I told him what happened. And he, he was standing at the time that I told him, you know, I almost died basically coming here. The tire flew off on the highway. I was going to like 140. The tire flew off and it was like metal, metal to the ground, like sparks were flying off, off, the, off, the, off the, the metal of where the tire should have been. And the car spun. Alhamdulillah, there wasn't traffic at the time. If there were traffic. Oh, that's, that's serious. Yeah. So eventually I got a, a tow truck to, to fold me into a, a gas station. They have like a mechanic there. I replaced the tire and kept going. And I got to the jam and I told him I did that. And he was sit standing when I told him that. He went to sit down like in shock. He said, that happened to you and you still came here? He said, I was just about to ask you. <laughs> he said, that happened, you still came here to the jam He said, <laughs> 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 I 
like, where was I supposed to go? You know, like, I don't, I don't know, he said. And he told, he looked at all the Saudi students and he said, you see that? They said, you see that? He said, this is someone who's coming for knowledge. He said, and then he started just bashing them for maybe the next half an hour. <laughs> so, but you guys make up lies and you, you come late. You make up lies. I know you're lying and I still let you come in. This guy almost died. And he said, why? Why is, why is that? And it was Aqi, the class. And he was a very beneficial professor. I said, because this is my whole purpose here. I said, this is why I came to Mecca. Like, I'm not like them. They have their houses. This is literally yeah, where they exactly. You just yeah, sleep yeah. in at home, chilling in your own house. What am I going to do? Yeah, so I said, no, this is what I came here for. So I'm going to uh, study. And I knew, like, if I miss a class, there's no one who's giving me the notes for that class. There's no one I can go to to say, you know, what did I miss? So, so what, were you the only um, foreigner in that class? <clears throat> I believe that class, I was the only foreigner. Yeah. And I think uh, that's how many, how many, how many students roughly on average? Yeah, it, it, it's, I would say usually it's 90% to 10% okay. of Saudi ratio. Yeah, it's like 90% to, 90 to 10% ratio. So how did you manage to, that's, that's the question I want you to kind of answer, if you can kind of give advice to those that, in terms of maintaining that life where you're studying and also looking after your family and providing for them. At that time, which was, um, it was kind of like a, 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 you know, it's not something that I wanted, but it was something that just had to happen because I, I did get married at that time, but I was planning to bring my family at that time, um, like on my own through the jam and, and everything when, when, once I'm able financially. But it, it was taking too long, so eventually um, it, she got a job in Jeddah. So that basically oh, covered the, the, the rent, which it wasn't something that I preferred, but it was something that I guess had to happen because of the circumstance. Um, yeah. we were, it was like, it was taking way too long, almost a year of, of being, you know, uh, apart. And so it was like, you know, by all means, and whatever it is, whatever it takes, I'll, I'll come. Yeah. And I wasn't that far compared to if you were like, you know, Medina and Jeddah or something like that. Yeah, oh yeah, that would have been way too, too difficult. Yeah. So um, even that though was difficult because she got pregnant immediately, literally immediately when we, when we got there. So then it was not only commuting back and forth, but also a pregnant wife. Um, yeah. It's sick and needs to go to the doctor. Yeah. Checks as well, and what have you? Huh? Yes, checks exactly. So, checks, yeah, appointments. Yeah. Well, all of that is a reality. If you face that, if you're a married, um, you know, student, it's something you'll deal with. And also, there are difficulties at the hospitals there. Obviously, if you're from the West um, and you're used to organization and you're used to you know certain things, you will face difficulties. And so, a lot yeah. of it was difficult. Um, I, 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 it wouldn't work. It didn't work anymore. And she went back uh, back home because of the because of the the way it was there. So uh, it, it is not something easy for a student to do. Um, if there are brothers who are not married, I would advise them if they can, which is maybe maybe no one, but if they can delay marriage until they study, <laughs> if they know themselves and they're able to uh, by a miracle from Allah. Uh, then I would advise that it'll make their studies easier um, because of worrying about a lot of different things. But if not, obviously a man is a man at the end of the day, then they have to be prepared uh, to face what they're going to face. And they have to know that although, yes, they are a student of knowledge and they're there to study, they have a priority now, someone living with them and they have a huge responsibility. Uh, you took someone's daughter and you know they, they expect you to take care of her and, and everything so um you do have that responsibility on top of your studies and on top of everything else so yeah it, it is not easy so uh, especially for the for the wife who doesn't know anyone there doesn't know um how to speak arabic doesn't know any, anything yeah. you're her only you're the only thing she has there basically any familiar anything familiar you're the only familiar thing for her so uh, yeah, it's something that yeah. definitely is. It's, it's not easy, man. It's not easy, subhanAllah. Uh, a lot of people are kind of, you know, um, brush it over their shoulders thinking they can do it until they get actually in that scenario and are tested. No. That's the thing I wanted to get into. So before I ask you in terms of who did you benefit from there and your, you know, the best experiences, I want to know 
what were the most toughest situations that you were put in and how did you manage to overcome them and carry on and you know after the tawfiq of Allah and his aid how did you manage to carry on you know with that whole full Duracell batteries you know carrying on for the purpose yeah. that you came out for <clears throat> yeah one of for me one of the toughest things is um is uh yeah, being away from family because i was going through uh personally my grandmother passed away while i was there that basically raised me uh, uh my aunt passed away while i was there my mother two of them so a lot of deaths in my family uh, i had um also a daughter here, so her growing up and I'm not there, a lot of different things were very, like heavy on me, heavy, you know, uh, a big burden, things you're thinking about. And, and so, you know, obviously those thoughts come to you, like, is it worth it still being here all this time? And yeah. You're losing family members, you know, you can lose your mother, your father, your siblings. At any given moment, a lot of those thoughts um, start start coming and creeping up on you, and um, it, it was that was that was difficult to, to maintain and to want to study, to find you know the himna, to want to study after you lost someone you know that close to you, etc. Um, so that was that was that also uh, some of the fitan that happened, people you were close with at one point, boycotting you for you know certain things. Uh, rumors or you know Naveem or what, whatever it is people you thought a certain way of but uh, some of those things bothering you in your studies Alhamdulillah Mecca itself wasn't as much because Mecca uh, there's not many foreigners also yeah, but uh, yeah. how busy you you know you're thinking about it consciously and things like that some of that also um, was there but mostly for me was the family because I'm the eldest of seven and uh, the like a father figure. Uh, I'm the oldest, you know, I'm the eldest in my family, and the youngest. Uh, well, yeah, my, my father remarried, so we have a youngest now that is only two years old. But before her, the youngest, um, who we share, you know, same parents and grew up in the same household, yeah, is 20 years younger than me, 20 years younger. So there's a 20 year gap between me and her, and uh. And so me being the, the, the eldest, and there's also boys who basically, when I started practicing, they just followed my lead. I do, I, wherever I would go, they would go with me. Whatever Durus I would go to, they would go with me. Um, yeah. Salah, they would go with me. Jum'ah, they would go with me. And um, me being away, I, I would see the effect of that. Okay, um, yeah, yeah. Because you're not in the picture anymore. Not in the picture, yeah. And so you see them slipping, you see, you know, how they're living now. And uh, one of them is lo locked up now. And is, is, mm -hmm. is, is, is something, the most serious thing that you can go to jail for, basically. And uh, sometimes I have a regret, you know, um, even sometimes fearing, you know, if uh, you'll be held accountable for it. Uh, and so that is uh, when you start seeing that you know everything around you, the people around you, your importance to them, to their lives, uh, and you know while you're abroad, you start thinking, yeah, what is the benefit of my ilm if this is happening to my family or this is happening to my loved ones, etc. Love Allah, these are the trials you go through. Life, there's loss, there's there's death, there's all these things happen to. Um, students while they're there. <laughs> yes. These are the, the biggest the biggest things that I have had to, to be honest, I can't even say overcome there because we're still dealing I'm still dealing with them. Um but uh, I just keep making dua to Allah that, that, that he, uh, it makes it easy. Allah you may Allah make it easy for you. I know the Muslims. So in terms of like um your you've you've spoken about that how about the best moment and how did you like what do you recall being your most you know the moment that literally instilled something within your heart that you'd never forget in terms of in terms of the jam and things like that anything generally speaking your time being there 
even if it's outside of the country, just your time being there studying, what was the moment that for you, it's like that was it? Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe the first Hajj, I would say. The first Hajj that I was able to make because I'm now you know, in Mecca studying. Yeah. And uh, that Hajj is memorable for more than one reason. Not just obviously the experience of Hajj, but because I did it on foot. <laughs> I did it on foot. And that experience, um, walking from Mina and Muzdalifa and Mina and Arafa to the Haram on feet and to the point where my feet were bleeding, gushing blood because of walking. And, I, and that's wearing sandals, not even barefoot. That's while wearing sandals but because of so much walking. I've never walked that much in my life. I <laughs> thought I was going to walk that much, but. Uh, <laughs> I would say some Somali brothers said, for them, this is a norm, you know, a norm. And this for me, that's definitely not a norm. <laughs> uh, SubhanAllah, that experience, maybe it took me maybe a week to be able to walk again. I couldn't even move my feet. I couldn't walk anymore. That's how tired my feet were, my legs were. Allah Akbar, wow. That's no. serious. Yeah, like five Because I was going to ask you, were you actually barefooted? Or, so then, and then obviously you clarified, SubhanAllah. But uh, they weren't good quality sandals. It was those regular white ones you see around the Haram. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I just got one of those somewhere uh, and just wore them. And yeah, they, they destroyed me, subhanAllah. So walking became difficult, very difficult for days, subhanAllah. I couldn't walk. And so that experience is memorable for more than one reason. My first Hajj and uh, also, um, um, yeah, the. The, the experience itself, the pain that I felt and the struggle of the Hajj itself was... Yeah, yeah. Another, um, probably maybe one of the best moments is um, a few years ago, me and a brother, me and a couple of brothers came together and we did a Umrah business. And so basically bringing people from here, from Canada and America yeah. for yeah. Umrah. And so we did it while I was there organizing and everything. But the two brothers that worked with me, they they came from Canada. So they actually, one of them was also there, but one of them was on the trip with the group. So on that trip, many of my friends and their families and my relatives, my mother, my brother, they were all on that trip. Long barik, mashallah. 70 people that I mostly know all of them, over 70, 75 people. And some of the du'at also, Salafi du'at in America, Sheikh Abdul Rahman Wa Maysan, Dr. Abdul Rahman was part of the group. And so, group and being there with some of my closest friends, and my family members, my relatives, my aunts, some of my aunts, my cousins, all of them being there, me leading them in Umrah, and you know, and teaching them how to make Umrah. And uh, it was uh, one of the best memorable moments. Moment. Yeah, one of in my entire life. Uh, no, no. No. Uh, yeah, I mean, while well, during my studies, but even my entire life, that was one of the best uh, to be able to bring my mom for, for Umrah and, 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 you know, doing Umrah with her. It was one of the best, best moments ever. Allahumma barik, mashallah. And how about all the gossip? I don't want to keep you because, you know, I've had you on here for a long time. May Allah reward you. Just to, before we conclude, um, with the gas to the Mashaykh that you benefited from and is there anything you recall with the gas that which you, you know, took home and you benefited because of the fact that, you know, whether it be their mannerisms, their hospitality, is there anything that you can, you know, enlighten yeah. us with? Yeah, so I, I would say um, who I benefited from most Yeah. Um, changed throughout my time there. Uh, just because of my sheikh moving and things like that. So when I first got there, it was Sheikh Rabi'a. Sheikh Rabi'a was in Mecca still at that yeah. time. We would have his general class on Fridays. Um, Araj al-Qabul, and then he would have a private class on Wednesdays, al Tirmidhi, and I would attend that. That was above my level, way above my level at that time. But I would go to benefit whatever I can I can take from his sharhan al Tirmidhi, and you know, even from his mannerisms, any faida that I can grasp, I would go for that. But the Araj al-Qabul class funded for about two years while when I was there, before he moved um, to Medina. Um, I was, he was probably the class that and I was mulazim so I'm going to the most. I would benefit from him, Shaykh Rabia, Hafidhullah, um, mm. one of the biggest things 
for me an eye opener is the the image that given or the um, the image that a lot of people have and it's depicted for them because of you know certain certain people is not at all what he, what he's like when you when you meet him in person especially when it's a smaller gathering and it's a gathering of benefit and things like that from the most soft uh, of mashaq from the most soft hearted of mashaq cries and i have a uh, some moments that i just had just with him myself um, i would go sometimes drive to pray asr with him or maghrib with him just to ask questions sometimes and and one time i went there uh, to pray with him in a small masjid in Mecca. and i prayed beside him and he after the salah i waited for him to do his uh, dhikr i gave him a few minutes and then uh, yeah, i wanted to ask him a question i started to you know like make dua for him and greet him and about to ask the question and then he said he said like give me a minute my son he said to me and he started picking up whatever he can see in the masjid of like mint or any type of was uh, any type of um, anything that would be dirtying the masjid. He started picking it up with his fingers and putting it into his thigh pocket here, his pocket, his chest pocket. Just whatever he can find, taking it here. Basically, not belittling any good deed. Yeah. You know. You know yeah. because that is something light, but that's alim, cleaning the house of Allah. That's something great yeah. in the sense. And I saw that Subhanallah that moved me. I said, he. Yeah, I mean that that basira to to do something like that that we would not even think of, yeah. you know, but something like that. Another time I saw we walked out. I held him walking out of the out of the masjid, and we saw a cat, a cat eating from from the garbage bin, and he started crying. And he started crying, and he said, "Walaqat karam Allah bani Adam." He said, "Yeah, I said Subhanallah." Like that would never occur to me. I just see a cat eating garbage. We see that every day, you know. What is that? So what did he say in here? وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمَ اللَّهُ بَنِي آدَمْ He said, SubhanAllah, SubhanAllah. Allah honored us as, as, as human beings, that we're not like this cat eating from garbage. That could be us, SubhanAllah. That's what he was thinking of. And he started crying. That's deep. So yeah, Wallahi, that, that, that type of um, insight and that soft-heartedness, because all the people and the image that people have of them is nothing but rudud or harshness and aggressiveness and you know these youtube clips here and there that's all people know of him but yeah yeah i'm with him and you see how soft-hearted he is and and his and, and his love for the haq and his love for the unity of the muslims and the salafis and this and that just, that's not what really um gets uh gets um, people see that side of him not a lot of people unless you studied with him and spent time with him you don't really see that that side of him so in the, indeed indeed and Shaykh Ahmed Bazmoul, likewise, he was teaching at that time. So they the, the two that I would say that benefited the most. And then while I was there, uh, Shaykh Muhammad Ali Adam, uh, Ethiopi, rahimahullah ta'ala, he mm. was given permission to teach in the Haram. And so when he began, as soon as he began, I was I was there. I started attending from the day. And what, and what year was that? I believe it was 2015, if I'm not mistaken. Either okay. 14 or 15. 14 or 15 and uh he began teaching okay philosophy uh, and some other books and and him subhanallah uh okay sorry to cut you um i just what one thing i didn't actually ask you earlier which has always been on my mind ever whenever i used to come to mecca wherever you guys students used to live you know on the outskirts or in from the haram however how many minutes you used to take to commute how did you guys used to commute when you used to drive your cars where did you guys just park your cars? <laughs> because I mean, Masjid Nabawi, alhamdulillah, we've got it so easy. You just go downstairs and just parking around the harem. But where did you guys used to leave your cars? So for me, I didn't have a car while I was there. And, and that's actually one of the, the biggest um, downsides of the Umar Qura campus. If you don't have a car, you can't even get out of there. You literally can't get out of there. Wow. Buses are, the buses end around 9 p.m. If you miss that bus and you're in the city, like in the town, yeah. How do I, taking a taxi all the way back that could be 50 riyals 40 riyals depending wow. on yeah but if you are at the jamia and let's say you get hungry and you want to go buy something to eat that's it but you, you're starving until the morning you cannot get out of that that campus that's how far away it is wow wow there's no way to walk um to uh so 
the only times I would have was if I rent cars, I would often rent cars. So if I had that, alhamdulillah, I could go. But um, around the Haram, there's an area called Kudayi. It's kind of like a, 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 you park your car and then there's a shuttle bus that takes you to the Haram. Yeah, so they use that now for people that come from outside. Yeah, so they do that. But there is no other, um, like for us who know Mecca, we would just park somewhere in Aziziya, leave our car somewhere and we take a taxi. As a group. Oh, so that's so, the only means, that's the only way you have to literally park and then take a taxi like that's the only way. There isn't there's no other way. Yeah. Wow. It needs its own parking lot somehow. Mm. And then, sorry, carry on with the cost to the uh, Sheikh Muhammad. Yeah, Sheikh Muhammad. Uh, so he was teaching in the Haram. Um and uh Alhamdulillah benefited from him from the years that I was there. Then there was a part where I was kind of away because that's when I started living in Jeddah and was married at that time. And I would, um, I would, um, yeah, I would miss a lot of classes because if I'm in the Jamia, classes, as you know, are after Maghrib and after Isha. For him, Isha after Maghrib. But I have to go back to Jeddah. I can now, I can no longer you know, attend in person. So yeah. that's also another thing. That brothers also have to consider when you when you're married and if you have a kid or things like that, it derails you sometimes from attending as many durus as you as you would like. Yeah. You would definitely like that. So um, I would say the ones that benefited the most were maybe Sheikh Rabia, Ahmed Li Adam, and um, Ahmed Bazmoon. And Ahmed Bazmoon would be the most consistent because from the beginning of my studies. I would uh, study with him up until yeah. he's outside of the jamia, and then yeah. up until they were very close, like very, very alhamdulillah, I have a very close relationship with him. And um, in the and jamia, he would teach regularly, like you mentioned. What's that? And he will teach regularly, like you mentioned. Yeah. So in the, in the beginning, he was teaching regularly in the masjid. Now he doesn't have classes like outside. He's more online. More he has the online mahad, but. Uh, before it was Durus, like in, in, in the Masajid, and so that was consistent. Um, and then, alhamdulillah, he started teaching me in the Kuliya. I think I've had him maybe four or five times in the Kuliya, he's taught me. Oh, yeah. God, mashallah, that's nice. Um, and then Muhammad Bazmoon also, likewise, he, he him, um, after Sheikh Rabi' left, Sheikh Rabi' um, yeah, he gave him, a, he, he advised him to continue teaching uh, Ma'alaj al Qabul. So he continued. Okay. So we continued and finished with Muhammad Dazu. Um, and then, um, so him, Alhamdulillah, I haven't gotten him in the jamia yet. Uh, his class fills up immediately. I've tried to get him, I've tried everything. And it, was, it wasn't possible, I haven't gotten him. But Sheikh Wasi, Alhamdulillah, I got him in the jamia. Uh, I got him in my first semester, actually. First semester, uh, which is basically, yeah, the muqaddim of ulum al-hadith. Uh, like uh, and the beginning, beginning stages of hadith or ilm al-hadith in the time of the Sahaba and how even yeah. um, the science came about. He taught us that that madda, and um, and then uh, I would say later on, uh, one of the mashaykh that I became really very close to and also benefited from, which is not a sheikh actually from Mecca, but he comes to Mecca so often that you we just consider him from Mecca, Sheikh Adil Mansur. Uh, yeah, so Sheikh Adam Masoor and Sheikh Ahmed Bazmoon very close. So whenever he comes, we go sit in a in a in a place, uh, his diwaniya in a private place and stuff, and we benefit and brothers read to him and things like that, and discuss different masail and many 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 benefits. For years we've been doing that. Whenever he comes to Mecca, so uh, I, I would say these are some of the mashaa that I may have been affected by the most, or benefited from the most, and wise. And then there are others that benefited from, in terms of dorat or, um, you know, traveling to them and, and, and attending their lessons. If they're explaining a book, a particular book, we would travel there and this and that. Um, Sheikh Sami Sukhair also, a student of Ibn Thaymi, when he would come to the Laham. Uh, Inshallah, we benefit from him. So, Alhamdulillah, there's a, there's a few. There's a few of the Sheikh. Sheikh Yahya al Mudaris. Yahya al Mudaris. Who's the who's the Sheikh of Muhammad Bazoul and Ahmed Bazoul and Musi al Abbas? All of them. He's an old, old Sheikh. He passed away not long ago. And uh, him also 
his Takhasus al Hadith, he would teach. Uh, I, I studied with him, Sahih Muslim, some Abu Abu, Sahih Muslim. And Fatih um, uh, uh, al Majid, he would teach. He would teach Kitab al Tawheed and Aqid al Philosophy. So, uh, Alhamdulillah, those three books he would teach. And, and Allah, he would teach Al Wasatiyah, finish it, start it again. Kitab al Tawheed, he teaches it, starts it again consistently. Over and over again, he would teach it. Yes, my Lord. Allah, 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 so Umm Qura is all online now. So usually, uh, yeah, like, subhanAllah, it's, uh, it's sad, but I, I don't actually know why it's the, the, the condition of the, you know, Umm Qura is the way it is right now. But their application online isn't really straightforward. A lot of people have problems with it. Um, I've tried to help a lot of people, um, you know, in the past and haven't been able to. I myself don't understand how to do it. Um, but it usually, um, when there, when the time comes for for applications, you usually just find out, like on social media, and they do have a um, a Twitter account. So if anyone follows their Twitter account, um, you'll be able to see. I guess they announce it. They usually say it's like in the new year, like a, like now, but you never know. Sometimes it's, it doesn't it doesn't happen at that time. Allah knows best, but it's usually announced and it spreads everywhere in WhatsApp groups or all over social media. Um, yeah. And for them, it's like a, it's like a one month window they give or something to apply. And it's usually online. So they, they, they no longer do um, in-person interviews or they don't take paperwork or anything like that. At um, but what you can do if anyone applies and if they apply that you can contact a student that's there myself either through social media or any other brothers who study there and ask us, uh, inshallah, while we're there, ask us to maybe verify, you know, if your, if your application got through and everything. Because I believe when you do apply, you get a, like a reference number. That follow up on your file. You'll, you'll see when it changes statuses and things like that. So yeah, for, for, for those brothers that want, by the way, um, that's another question. The brothers, if you do want to do that and you want to apply, his all of his social media platforms are going to be in the description of this video, so you can just contact him directly. May Allah reward the brother for you know for putting his uh, you know time and effort for, for doing that. Akhil Kareem is with regards to the sisters. How is the process if a sister now wants to apply and she has no male relatives? No. Can she still be accepted? Can she still apply? If she has a male relative, how does she go about applying? Because, you know, we talk a lot about the brothers, but Masakin, you know, the, the sisters, a lot of them do want to study and benefit. How do they go about doing that? You know, up until most recently, I believe there was no way. I believe the rule was um, that if she does not have a mahram, then yeah. they won't. But they would, if a sister gets accepted, they will automatically accept her mahram. That would always happen. Um, so she had either, whether it's a brother or whether it's her husband, they would get accepted together. Um, however, now, because of the rule change, I believe now, of like a uh, woman allowed to now go to Saudi back and forth and travel with her, yeah. I believe, yeah. right? So yeah. I changed. I believe now if a sister does apply, she's able to go there now. Uh, Allah alam. I may have to verify that, inshallah, when I go back. But I do believe that's the case now. Uh, I don't think she needs a mahram anymore. Okay, and generally speaking, when you know she applies, is it the same setup for sisters where they go through the Arabic Institute and then the Kulia and they have their own campus also. Their campus is actually very close to the Haram, it's an area called Zahir. Um, but they are building a new campus, it could be finished by now, to be honest. Um, but it's right beside the, the men's campus. Okay. Uh, them, they're blessed to be within the Hudud of the Haram. They're literally right at the border. <laughs> at the border. Outside, huh? They still get the 100,000, you know, rewards for the salawat. And us, I, I always joke to brothers, when they ask us, you know, they ask me, where is the, 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 
the campus, the Umukura Brothers Campus, and I say, just just know that when I pray, the reward is the same as if you're in Canada. It's the same. Because <laughs> <laughs> you're outside of the Hudud, Allah Yeah, Allah so We hope Allah rewards for it. You know, it's not in our hands, you know, the fact that the, the thing is there. The campus. But how, how you know, to, to be quite, you know, like, um, honest, how many times would a student, let's say they are there, would they be able to actually go to the haram? Let's say they don't have a car. Like, how practical is it? And how many times would they be able to catch a salah in the haram, jama'ah? Oh, no. Um, like, Fajr, forget about it. Unless you, like, really, you know, take your car and go there, like, at 4, 4.30 a.m. That, you can forget about it. Fajr. Dhuhr, you're most likely in the jama'ah. Asr, starting Asr. So you could do Asr, Maghrib, Isha, usually. Um, pretty much every day, depending on your, your schedule at the jama'ah. But if you have evening classes, then it's very rare that you'll go to the haram. Um, so me, what I would always do is try to make my classes all in the morning, all in the daytime, okay. so I can take the dhuhr outside. And we have also that flexibility of choosing our classes and picking and choosing the professor. I don't know if it's like that for you guys, but we have it. Yeah, it's become a bit more easier now. Um, yeah. Since I think maybe what, two, three years ago, they made it a bit more easier. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> yeah. so, uh, um, how about with regards to masters? Yeah. Masters. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I, I didn't. Sorry, I caught you off point. Yeah, I was saying um, that there's also a bus that takes you for Juma. So Juma, um, there's a bus okay. that takes Rajahi, Mr. the Rajahi, and and the yeah. Haram. It doesn't go all the way to the Haram. It'll go like as close as possible, and then from there you take a taxi with a group of us. They just share taxis, like four four at a, four at a time take taxis. Um, but uh, um for um and then the weekend you can go to the haram as well and but the reason students do it so that the cost is, is 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 less for them they they go as groups so that you know they split the cost of the taxi so if yeah. they charge 40 reals to the to the jamia uh, each one pays 10 you know it's a little easier than if you take it by yourself you're paying that whole 40 by yourself yeah yeah and um for the masters what are you asking for the masters yeah, how's the setup? Is it easy? You just apply and have the grades, and you know, you have an interview. How how's that? That's how it used to be. It used to be that they look at your marks, so your, your grades, and um, maybe any tashkiyat you can get from your dikantara that helps. Um, and there's a there's a formal interview. There's like a panel who will question you. Um, sure you studied in the kulia. Yeah. And there's a uh, there's a um, I don't even know what it's called in English, like the Qudrat test. It's like a general test just to see. Similar to an IQ, right? That, yeah, IQ test, right? like a competency test, I think. Yeah, yeah. So they want to see like if you're competent. They ask you general questions, math, math questions, things like that. And you have to get, I think, 75% or higher um, in order to, to, to get accepted to the Kulia. Um, so, sorry, to the Masters. So if yeah. you get... And then you then you can get the masses. But now, subhanAllah, there's a new mudir, there's a new president of the Jamia who's made a lot of changes from Al-Qur'an. And this is all like I'm hearing from students. This is all while I've been in Canada. And um, they're saying uh, that um, they're saying that uh, like a lot of them that were were like are on the same level, they've now graduated. While I've been here they've graduated, but none of them got into the masses. All of them got full um, Yeah, all of them. Even though they they would have qualified in terms of uh, their marks, but a lot of the students, Subhanallah, who maybe came from some of the African countries, they don't have any formal education, so they can't even take that that competency test. They know ilm, you know, the ilm shari that they studied, yeah. but they can't take competency. Test. They've they've never studied these things before. Yeah. So it, it was too difficult for them. So that was the shari. Before that was more only a shot for Saudi students. Um, okay. They have to do it now. The foreigners have to do it. So Subhanallah, for the ones who came from some countries where they didn't really study that before, then it's it's difficult for them. They can uh, they can get in. So, so, yeah, they bought that. They, they they bought that recently, a couple of years back as well. It was really annoying for a lot of the students that wanted to further their education going to masters. Well, I understand, unfortunately. 
Yeah, so so so, so now um, what they told them to do is you take your khuruj nihai, you apply for your masters, and if you get in, then we bring you back. But how you know everyone knows how likely is that? <laughs> yeah, once you're out, you're out. That's it. Yeah. Once you accept that, you know, final exit, that's it. Yeah, you know, there's students that still until today, like or people who have been accepted to Umm Qura, but the wizara mm -hmm. hasn't given them muwafaqah. The, the Ministry of Education hasn't given them approval yet. So the yeah. Jamia, yeah. and they are now going to be a student at Umm Qura. But because Umm Qura is, it has a shortage, a severe shortage in dorm rooms, uh, so many students have been accepted for years haven't come. I helped wow. one brother, he was waiting for four years to come just because there was no dorms. So Umm Qura has to prove that they have space in the dorms in order to get those students accepted. And that's the problem because there's some sort of folder where some students are just staying for so long, they should have been graduated a long time ago, but they're just there just chilling and nothing, no one's really doing anything about it. So this now professor, which is a good thing at the end of the day, He's coming to clean all of that up. He, he's changed the administration of almost every department. He's uh, He gave like a new rule where if you don't graduate within six years, you're out. Even if you have one course left, you're out. No, it's no exceptions. Yeah, that's serious. Uh, so it, it's cleaning things up. It's better that way. Uh, Mashallah. I end on a note, I, you know, it's been long. May Allah reward you for your time. If you can just give any final piece of advice to general advice where they will be applying or they will be seeking knowledge whether because you know and there is one point i wanted you to kind of highlight uh, and elaborate there are a lot of people that don't have the capability of you know applying to these universities maybe because of their age maybe because of their responsibilities what advice do you give to them and if you have any general pieces of advice you can give to all those listening may allow you yeah, yeah. so um the first thing i would say is that knowledge seeking knowledge is not only at those Jamia Islamic universities. It would be a blessing if everyone you know, can get accepted to one of these universities and study there. However, it doesn't end there if you cannot get there. Um, the key though that I would say, especially in this time after contemplating a lot of things that you know, in my time of studies or just in terms of practice or in, ter in terms of the da'wah scene, and a lot of what I have witnessed, the state of uh, the da'wah, the state of the Muslims, or the state of the Salafis more specifically, is uh, the the detriment in how uh, susceptible, how vulnerable you will be in terms of in inhiraf, in terms of deviation, if you do not know the Arabic language. The importance of the Arabic language, I cannot emphasize enough. Um, you will understand your deen for yourself. You will not need a translator to tell you what the deen of Allah is or what the scholars are saying. You will not need. And so a lot of people are falling into hizbiyah due to the lack of not Arabic. If they were to have been, if they were to have access to those scholars directly, you know, because of Arabic, being able to understand Arabic themselves, they wouldn't be so dependent on any so and so and so and so telling them this is what it is, or this is what you should be following. Rather, right? someone who is able to, and that's something that I myself have um, subhanAllah, experienced from the time that before I went to study, and when I started learning Arabic and I was able to understand the ulama on my own, what we were being told in the West and what is actually happen happening on the ground is two different stories. Yeah. So, who's, you know, has the Arabic language, you don't know what that ni'mah is like. And when I mean in Hiraf, I mean in Hiraf a deviation. What I mean is even if into different sects, you know, that you can go you, you can go astray that way, or you can go astray thinking you are Salafi and following Salafi and following Salafi principles and all of that. But in reality, you're nothing but you're nothing but an individual who is fully dependent on someone else to tell them this is what the D of Allah is. You actually don't have an understanding of your own. You have the understanding of the one who told you what the deen is. The translator or that student or that that or whoever it is. It myself, it could be anyone. You will always be vulnerable if you don't have the Arabic language. You will always be able to be pulled here and there and steered here and there if you don't know the Arabic language. And the and the doors that the Arabic language opens for you, understanding the book of Allah, 
understanding the ahadith of the Messenger of Allah If you mm-hmm. think you have an, a, a faham of the deen of Allah in the English language, you're mistaken. Uh, you're mistaken. You're, 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 the best that can be said is that you have a minimal understanding, if not, no understanding at all. But the best that can be said is that you have some you know, minimal understanding of some aspects of the deen, but it's not enough I mean, to, to, to know the deen of Allah. And that, that is why we see with every fitna that occurs or with every wave, any, any shubha that, that, that is um, you know, spread or, or put, up, put on the internet or whatever it is, uh, the wave of people that follow it, the amount of people that follow it, it is because a lot of it goes back to uh, lack of knowing the Arabic language, which gives you access to the ulama. Anyone who says that they are connected to the scholars, yet they don't know Arabic, they're lying to themselves. Connection to the scholars is not your physical connection in terms of your body or the amount of times you can recite their name or the amount of times you can claim that you love them. Connection to the ulama, the that I learned, the first teacher that I learned, the Hawab Rahman, Muhammad Ali Ajal, the Libyan, who took me by the hand when I started practicing and, and taught me, is that connection to the ulama is ilm. It's not what people think, oh, when I visited, I ate with this sheikh and I took a picture and put it on Twitter. And I'm eating here with this one and I'm drinking tea with this one. Or I walk this one to the bathroom and I'm driving this one in my car. That is not the connection to the ulama. And so he would say that a long time passed where some of my mashaykh, I no longer have a connection with them because my connection for them was was in. And so, and not being able to go back to the memlaka, do just life and things like that. Um, if you have no other need, because other people have some need, there's a reason other than actual ilm and benefit that they continue with these visits and, and you know, uh, to the mashaykh. And it's a it's another agenda. That connection has other yeah, the, um, goals or other agendas. But if your um, your uh, your goal is to learn and understand the Deen of Allah as it has been revealed, as the Salaf of this Ummah were upon upon, then you need to be connected to the ulama ilmiyan. You have your connection to the ulama has to be based on knowledge, has to be based because they are the ones who understand the deen. They are the ones that, and you have faham of the religion and you benefit from their faham. And you benefit from uh, their faham and their understanding. And that is how you will understand your deen without any, um, you know, without being vulnerable, without being dependent on anyone. Anyone, when I say anyone, I mean myself. I mean anyone who's, in, who's giving da'wah in the English language. Uh, mm-hmm. There isn't, obviously, because uh, there are non-Muslims and this and that, but, if you yani, brag about being upon the da'wah for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, and you still can't understand the Arabic language, then you have to question yourself. And you mm-hmm. are, and you, and you are, um, you are uh, content with taking knowledge from yani, someone who they themselves, their knowledge is limited. As a student of knowledge, your knowledge is limited. You can give fatawa, you can and things so you you as a layman who's taking from that student your knowledge won't pass the level of that student you will always be limited in your understanding of the deed and because you're not you don't have access to the scholars yourself rather you have a filter in between the scholars and you and until you break out of that cycle and and uh and you break off these shackles that you have whatever obstacles that are in your way and you um you put your head down and you you learn the Arabic language, you will start to see that a lot of things that you may believe to be correct and you believe to be um, uh, yani Salafi or, or the Deen of Allah, you'll be surprised to see that um, the scholars do not explain certain things in that way. And, and they, do not, they don't have that, you know, certain aspects of, uh, of, of the Deen or how they're twisted or whatever the case is. People use it for their, for their own gain or whatever the case is. The ulama, alhamdulillah, don't have that. And so the importance, I can't stress enough, the importance of the Arabic language. Um, that is the only way you will, will truly understand your religion for yourself and, and without needing anyone else. And so also those who, um, as you mentioned, who may not be able to go to those universities, whether it be age or just life, 
and then learn the Arabic language. Uh, try to find uh, classes or courses or people who are teaching the Arabic language where you can study Arabic from your own home and then you'll be able to get to a level where you'll be able to understand the ulama and listen to their tapes in your own home. Today we have the name of, of technology that if we use it correctly, that we will be able to still benefit and, and, and even reach very high levels in terms of our knowledge, you know, in terms of our knowledge and our understanding and, and everything. And it's not, a, it's not a must that you have a you know, degree from an Islamic university. Ibn Baz doesn't have a degree. Abdul Muslim Abad doesn't have a degree. Sheikh Rabia doesn't have a degree. A lot of these mashallah, well, they have degrees because they did PhDs and everything, but they were ulama when none of this existed, you know, when, when these shahadat and these certificates didn't exist. Yeah. Sheikh Rahimahullah used to say he had his he had PhDs and he said, I don't even know where they are. I would not be able to tell you where they are. You know, say, because it wasn't it, for them it wasn't that whole certificate or anything, it was just about benefiting and getting close to Allah and knowing Allah more, isn't it? It's a knowledge. Exactly. Exactly, and that is the thing. So the ulama are not the goal, you know. The connection is not, uh, yani the connection to the ulama isn't the goal in, in and of itself. It's the yeah. benefit from their end. It's the benefit from their end. To just use their names as weapons and to use their names as, a, as like a, some, some, some jingle that you just keep singing all the time to make people believe that this is connection to ulama. That is not connection to ulama. And I even advise myself and the students, the Salafi students of knowledge, who Allah may have blessed with understanding and, and, and had protected them from falling into some of these types of things, uh, to give your students that tarbiyah, to teach the students who attend your lessons that connection to the ulama when you, you are introducing them, because it is an important thing to teach those who um, that you are teaching about the ulama and who they are and who you take your knowledge from. To, to give them the actual Salafi tarbiyah, which is the connection and our love for the ulama is due to their, is due to their knowledge. And not loving them and, and having wala and bara for them themselves as individuals. That is something that we have to change in terms of, uh, in terms of our da'wah, so that the people have a, have a correct uh, and a sound understanding of, of the deen and, and how we are to, um, and they take from the ulama and how we are to to deal with our ulama. I feel the whole Allah for those pieces of advice. Allah Azza wa reward you and ask Allah Azza wa to make this gathering a beneficial one and to make it from those that will testify for us Yom Qiyamah and not against us. And for all those once again that are tuning in, listening, then if you want to benefit from Akhuna uh, Abu Saleh Ilyas, Sayyidaroos, then you can find the his social media platforms on within the description that is going to be uploaded, inshallah, in this actual video. May Allah Azza wa reward him. And inshallah, this is the first of many, bi'ithnillah, um, gatherings. May Allah Azza wa reward you. Barakallahu feekum. Wa subhanakallahu wa alhamdulillah. Shalwa la ilahi la inta staghfika wa atubu ilayk. Wa jazakum la khair. Wa barakallahu feekum. Wa ahsanallahu ilaykum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaykum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.